Hi, my name is Michael Abraham, and I'm here to talk to you today about fascism, feminism, magic, and epic poetry. Which is a lot for 15 minutes, but I think we can do it. And I think we can do it by talking about the work of a modernist poet active between the early 19-teens and 1961 named H.D. Hilda Doolittle was born in 1886 in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. She showed an early penchant for languages, mastering both Latin and Greek in her teens. And when she was just 15 and he was just 16, she met the infamous modern poet Ezra Pound in Philadelphia. H.D. and Pound became friends. They fell into a courtship. They got engaged. Long story short, in 1911, she, uh, she expatriated to London and she never came back. But she was kind of an unexpected girl most of the time. Um, and it wasn't very long before she broke off her engagement to Pound and married a mutual friend of theirs named Richard Aldington. That's Aldington over there, the blonde one. That's Pound. And that's Hilda. Together, these three would form the core of what would come to be known as the Imagist movement. Imagism, T.S. Eliot would say several decades later, was the touchstone moment of modernist poetry in English. The Imagists sought to strip meter out of English poetry, preferring instead to compose the line in sequences of musical phrases. They also sought to strip English poetry of unnecessary poetic adornment, focusing their poems instead on the barest and most psychologically impactful image. Hence, imagism. We're in the habit of referring to people of this generation as the lost generation. There's two reasons for that. The first reason is that this group of early 20th century high modern European writers is actually largely composed of expatriate Americans, hence lost to America. The other reason for that is because this is the generation who had their social world shattered by the First World War. H.D. was only 28 when the First World War broke out. Richard Aldington served for the British on the front lines, and when he returned, he suffered from what we today would understand to be post-traumatic stress disorder. At the time, it was just called shell shock. His marriage to H.D. disintegrated extremely rapidly. For her part, she got pregnant with his, his child in the middle of the war. It was her first pregnancy, which ended in miscarriage. Until the end of her life, she would attribute that to war stress. In the wake of the war, H.D.'s politics took a hard no nosedive to the left. Pound's politics, however, began to drift increasingly to the nationalist right. You might be aware that by the 1930s, Pound was a radio broadcaster for the Fascisti in Mussolini's Italy. Hence, the drama of the Great War fractured what Pound had sought so painstakingly to build. She still had friends in Europe. She was still writing. But her center, her ground, her domestic life had been shattered. That is, until she met this woman. Annie Winifred Ellerman, the daughter of Sir John Ellerman, a shipping magnate and the richest man in England. <laughs> H.D. was openly bisexual throughout her life, and Ellerman, who would come to be known to history by her pen name, Briar, was an openly lesbian. They fell into a very passionate romance, which eventually turned into a polyamorous, lifelong partnership and a family. Uh, H.D., Briar, and Briar's homosexual husband, Kenneth McPherson, raised a daughter, Perdita Schaffner, who died in 2001. Briar, is remembered by history as a novelist, but originally she wanted to be a poet. I've looked at some of Breyer's early poetry, it leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> but, but, Breyer's importance to the world of modern poetry cannot be understated. Utilizing her immense inheritance, she financially underwrote an entire generation of poets. She also financially underwrote an entire generation of American, German, and Austrian psychoanalysts many of whom were Jews. Breyer and H.D. together developed several close and often very complex relationships with the giants of psychoanalysis and sexology in their day, people with whom you might be familiar, like Hans Sachs, a contemporary of Freud's and one of the early champions of the Freudian model, Havelock Ellis, a sexologist and one of the first modern theorists of homosexuality, Anna Freud, Sigmund Freud's daughter and a theorist herself who, in the wake of her father's passing, ensured the entrenchment of his legacy, and, of course, the master himself, Sigmund Freud. 
with whom H.D. would engage analysis in, in Vienna in 1933 and 1934. The letters between H.D. in Vienna and Breyer in Switzerland in 1933 and 1934 are fascinating because the period of H.D.'s analysis coincided perfectly with the first two years of the Third Reich in Germany. Often in H.D.'s accounts of sessions with Freud, he appears to be the patient and she appears to be the doctor. The whole session taken up with long monologues about his anxieties and his fears. As you might know, Freud was a Jew. And he was powerfully detested by the German Academy, which in the 1920s had swung very far to the right. Freud, in his day, was considered very far to the left. You see, one of the cornerstones of the Nazi agenda upon which they campaigned in the early 1930s was the forced unification of Germany and Austria. Freud and his other Austrian, Austrian Jewish peers feared that such a unification would mean absolute doom for themselves and their families. They were, of course, not wrong. Nevertheless, H.D.'s analysis was a very successful one. And while she was plumbing the depths of her psyche in his little study in Vienna, Breyer, because of her connections to the gay and lesbian world of Europe, as well as to the Jewish intelligentsia of Europe, had begun to receive requests from friends for assistance in exiting and, or in relocating from Germany and Italy. In helping out those friends, Breyer began what was probably the most important work of her life. We don't know exactly how many refugees Breyer helped to escape the Nazis and the fascisti by the end of the war, uh, because she herself did not know. We do know, however, that it was so many that by the end of the war, Breyer's abandoned chateau in Kenvik, Switzerland, was an unofficial stop on the refugee routes that led out of Germany and Austria and into the relative safety of France and Britain. The book that we're talking about today is not from 1933 or 1934. But it's important that we lay this historical grounding because it draws very heavily on H.D.'s understanding of the cultural shifts in Austria and Germany in the 1930s, as well as the insight and perspective gained by Breyer's activism. When the war broke out, H.D. and Breyer decided the safest place for their little family to go was London. This was a thing that a lot of European liberals who were well-connected and had means thought. Anna and Sigmund Freud thought the same thing. It was the conventional wisdom of 1939 that you weather the Second World War in London. That's because nobody really knew what was coming in 1940. From 1940 to 1941, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, uh, undertook a merciless bombing campaign of London, which would come to be known to the British media as the Blitz. H.D. and Breyer owned several properties in London. It didn't really matter. It didn't matter if they were at Breyer's house or at H.D.'s flat. Bombs fell on their neighborhood, sometimes seven days a week. In the midst of this two years of horror, H.D. was furiously writing. Breyer, for her part, took to exploring decimated churches. One feels like the whole family was searching for some sort of beauty in the rubble, you know? Anyway, in the wake of the Blitz, in 1942, H.D. began to sift through everything she'd written in the, in the previous two years. And she composed a poem called The Walls Do Not Fall, which forms the first of the three poems that make up the book we're here to talk about today, Trilogy. Trilogy is composed of three epic poems of 42 cantos each, titled The Walls Do Not Fall, Tribute to the Angels, and The Flowering of the Rod. Walls begins in this moment of calamity, or maybe the absence of calamity, the horrible silence that follows two years of thunder. Over us, apocryphal fire. Under us, the earth sway, dip of a floor, slope of a pavement where men roll, drunk, with a new bewilderment, sorcery, bedevilment. The bone frame was made for no such shock, knit within terror, yet the skeleton stood up to it, the flesh, it was melted away. The heart burnt out, dead ember. Tendons, muscles shattered, outer husk dismembered. When we talk about the Blitz, 
it's important that we bear in mind that it was historically unprecedented. Never before had such terror rained down from the skies. Certainly. Never before had such terror rained down from the skies upon a heavily populated civilian area. And you hear that shock echoing in the poetry. The only thing that stands up to such immense violence is the barest and most durable part of the body, the skeleton. The content of the body, the flesh, what feels, what knows, what relates, how we touch. That's all emptied away. Yet the frame held. We pass the flame. We wonder what saved us, what for? These two questions will become the animating questions of trilogy. As HD's speaker goes on a three poem long spiritual journey to find new content for the body which has been emptied by this rupture in the continuity of history, she continually returns to her own position in history, as both global and personal, continually asking something along the lines of, why me? Often overlooked in our contemporary conversations about German and Italian fascism of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s is the gendered component of their rhetoric. Early intellectual progenitors of fascism in the 1920s, people with whom you might be familiar, like Filippo Tommaso Marinetti in Italy or Ernst Jünger in Germany, were, like Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler, veterans of the First World War. Unlike Aldington, they did not return from the First World War with their psyche shattered and spend decades putting their social lives back together. They returned from the First World War with their psyches powerfully transformed, yearning, to get back to the trenches. Junger at one point writes, the war is the father of all things and our father too. He believed that the war would provide what Nietzsche had promised, the vision of the new man who finally would lead the German people on to ultimate global ontological success. For him, war was about stripping away bourgeois refinements and feminist and feminine tendencies. And so Junger, like Marinetti, like Mussolini, like Hitler, yearned for a perpetual war because only a perpetual war would put enough stress on the human body that finally it would break through in its final stage of ontological evolution and be the sort of being it always was meant to. Thus, we might summarize fascism like this. Sociologically, fascism is organized around an intense masculinism. The Jeffrey Herf in 1986, a political scientist, calls it the masculine community of the trenches. And he says that it provided them with their notion of the good life, of the perfect society. And ontologically, fascism is about the weaponization of the body, the stripping away of the bourgeois and the stripping away of the feminine until the body is nothing but pure machine. Notice, in this socio-ontological configuration, there's a sort of glaring rhetorical absence, which is the female. And whenever women appear in fascist rhetoric, they're instrumentalized as sites of breeding. Women are important because they produce soldiers who will then go fight the perpetual war and in their fighting and dying, get us one step closer to the ultimate weapon of war, the new man. Now, remember, H.D. was in Austria in 1933. She knew that this was the rhetoric. She'd seen it take over the universities, and she'd watched it spill out of the universities and into the streets, as fraternities were replaced by paramilitary groups, as cafes, which for a very long time had hosted a number of queer people and artists and political dissidents and students, suddenly were unsafe. In fact, in 1933, her analysis was cut short because she was riding a train that was bombed by anti-fascist anarchists. Violence was all around. When she returned in 1934 to complete her analysis with Freud, she found a city gripped by significantly more fear than it had been just a few months before. Germany and Austria would be forcibly united in 1938. 
We know she was aware of this rhetoric because Trilogy responds to it rather directly. Let's take a look. Let us entreat Hesh, Aphrit, Isis, the great enchantress in her attribute of Serket, the original great mother who drove harnessed scorpions before her. Let us, in, let us, let, let us replace, let us substitute enchantment for sentiment. Rededicate our gifts to spiritual realism. Thank you for your laughter. So to Jünger's image of the new man, HD is positing the old woman. And by old, I mean pre-Christian, pre-Western, pagan, like really old. <laughs> but she's imbuing that woman with all of the ferocity, like literally giant scorpions and a chariot, like all of the ferocity it's going to need to ride out against the new man. She does something else that's even cooler at the end of this canto. She writes, be ye wise as ass, scorpions as serpents. Those are her italics. And in the italicized words, be ye wise as serpents, there's a coded critique of Christianity and thus of Western history in total. It's a common Christian mythic trope that women and serpents are deceivers of men. And that because of the, the collusion of Eve and the serpent in the Garden of Eden, we lost paradise. H.D. flips back to Genesis. She reads the story again. She notices something. It's not sinfulness that the serpent promises to Eve. It's the knowledge of good and evil. Once Eve gains the knowledge of good and evil, a kind of wisdom, she also gains the ability to choose. For the first time, a human being makes a choice, which is not part of the history that has been engendered by the patriarchal dominant male god. Eve's transgression is also the mythic start of history in Christianity. It's the first time human beings interact in autonomous and surprising and emotional ways. So, what she's really saying is that in a history writing and a history telling dominated by a patriarchal center, it is precisely those decisions which read as transgressions that move things in unexpected and also capacious ways. One might actually say that the whole gambit of trilogy is the revision of the Christian. Um, and I want to talk about two other rather poignant Christian revisions, and they have to do with the two Marys. The Virgin Mary appears in that second poem, Tribute to the Angels. And when she appears to the speaker, she comes holding a Bible. And when the speaker flips through the Bible, she finds there's no words in the Bible. Because that text, the Holy Bible, perhaps more than any other, begins a textual tradition which has as one of its fundamental cornerstones the obfuscation of female voices. So when the most divine figure in Christianity appears to the speaker, she comes not with a Bible that's to be read, but with a Bible that's to be filled. In the flowering of the rod, we get the other Mary, Mary of Magdala or Mary Magdalene. The Mary who was a prostitute out of whom Christ drew seven demons. She appears to a male onlooker in the poem and something Super weird happens. And as she drew the scarf towards her, the speck, fleck, grain or seed opened like a flower. And the flower, thus contained in the infinitely tiny grain or seed, opened petal by petal, a circle. And each petal was separate, yet still held, as it were, by some force of attraction to its dynamic center. And the circle went on widening and would go on opening, he knew, to infinity. But before he was lost, out of time completely, he saw the islands of the blessed, he saw the Hesperides, he saw the circles and circles of islands around the lost center island Atlantis. He saw what the sacrosanct legend said still existed. He saw the lands of the blessed, the promised lands, lost, 
key in that half second. So the whole scope and plan of our and his civilization on this, his and our earth before Adam. Okay, that's a lot. So unpack that for a second. Most Christian theological traditions would tell you that of all of the penitents of Christ in the gospel, Mary of Magdalene is the purest of heart and the truest. Oh, of our and his civilization on this, his and our earth before Adam. Most Christian theologians would tell you <clears throat> that of all of the penitents of Christ in the gospels, Mary Magdalene is the purest of heart and the truest. So she appears in this poem, and from her figure blossoms forth a whole history that Christ can't account for, a pre-Christian pagan history. Importantly, notice it's stressed multiple times that in losing this history, we lost our salvation. Something was promised to us that we lost, but it opens from an infinitely tiny seed in her scarf. Okay, so we might read the infinitely tiny seed opening into infinite histories as a sort of image of feminine generativeness. But it's not the generations extending forward from the mother. It's generations extending backward from the prostitute. You see, for HD, the present is a moment of dynamic interrelation between the past and the future. If we want to engender better futures, if we dream of a Europe whose history is not dominated by male principles of domination, organized by male principles of domination, then we have to look to those things which have been forgotten. Remember when I said that a textual tradition that is male obfuscates the female? That really means we remember half of history, guys. Half of history has been told to us because half of history has been allowed to be told to us. So every time we retell it, we commit all of those little violent erasures. Over and over again, when you learn history, you learn how to violently erase women. So HD, in trying to tell history different and believing that that's going to make for a different future, is committing that magic I promised you we'd talk about. Somehow remembering differently, <laughs> somehow remembering differently refigures time. It's not going to be easy. Make sure that we know it's not going to be easy. We know no rule of procedure, she writes. We are voyagers, discoverers of the not known, the unrecorded. We have no map. Possibly we will reach haven, heaven. So maybe it's kind of an unsatisfying answer. But I think the reason that she was saved, why me, was to write this book. <laughs> you see, this book is a first attempt at stepping outside of sanctioned knowledge at stepping outside of male-dominated epistemologies, at stepping outside of literary canons and historical canons and national boundaries, and trying to think about history differently. It's a woman writing. And it is a woman writing in such a way that she believes she is laying down a sort of enchantment for a new kind of future if only we would take up the task. Trilogy reminds us in our own reactionary times, characterized by authoritarianism, violent hatred of difference, and the jocular contempt for women, that it is the voices of women in which we hear the echoes of the things we've forgotten, in which we discover all of the wonder of the stories we never told. Because it's the voices of women, more often than not, that point us toward futures we didn't imagine.